Welcome everybody to a discussion on inclusive theater. Today we are so honored to have three directors, plus myself, so four directors, mm -hmm. who are working on a one-act play festival that features plays written by people with autism and other disabilities and is performed by people with autism and other disabilities and will be presented online May through August of this year. So let us introduce ourselves. We're going to start with Carrie. Hi, my name is Carrie Johnston, and I am the creator, uh, creative director and founder of the Shopworks Theater Company. And what that is, is an adult day service that operates around the art of the theater to support adults with disabilities. And we're going to see a very interesting clip of your company in action in just a little bit. Thank you, Carrie. Let's move on to Fran. Hi, I'm Fran Salou, and I serve as the Executive Artistic Director of Circle Theater, which is an inclusive theater for individuals of all abilities based in Omaha, Nebraska. Ooh. And finally, <laughs> Camilla. Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Camilla Khan. Um, I am the theater specialist at an agency called the DAP Community Network, formerly known as UCP. Um, I work at the day habilitation programs of ADAPT and um, I'm in charge of working with um, people creating theater performances, running theater workshops, and mostly creating community partnerships um, with different theater organizations in New York. Thank you, Camilla. So we're from all around the country. My name is Wendy Duke and I'm from Akron, Ohio. I have been doing theater all my life but I started getting interested in doing theater with people who have autism when I was a public school teacher in the early 2000s and a number of students with autism were attracted to the drama program and I wanted to know why and that led to a pretty much a change of career. Now I work exclusively with people on the spectrum and people with disabilities and I've found it has been um, a great source for personal satisfaction and something that I'm giving to the community. So we're going to go over a lot about what we do, why we do it, how we do it as theater directors. Let us look, let's start our conversation by looking at a clip about Shopworks Theater Company. All right, Ellie, some of our most creative, brilliant minds best express themselves through art from the written word or the spoken word to visual creation. Art can forge pathways to better lives. In Ohio, one organization in particular works to make sure artistic expression includes people across a spectrum of abilities. They value themselves here. They're not, they don't lead with their disability. They lead with what they can do on the stage. The play's the thing, but the person's a true work of art. If you want to feel paradise, simply look around and you win. A performance from Shopworks Theater Company proves that point. I never liked to be around big groups, so I never liked to dance in front of big groups or sing in front of big groups. You know, I, I've always, I was always scared of doing that. But ever since I started here, it's like all those fears just went right off the door. A group of adults with varying cognitive disabilities meet here each week to rehearse and reveal what's inside. I like Disney music. Disney music and Broadway music. When I get somebody new that comes in and may only be able to talk to me through a puppet, and I accept that and build on that, and eventually the puppet goes away, a new character is born. For Andy Wilmore, his musical talent was not revealed through song or dance or even playing an instrument. It's interesting that art does portray a certain humanness and amplifies a certain humanness, magnifies it into clear vision. Andy envisions and then composes music via his computer. He's currently in school at Capital University, hoping someday to compose for video games or even movie producers. As an artist, as a composer, as someone on the spectrum in all three of those regards, being able to network with other people is actually a passion of mine. When artists like them seek support, 
VSA Ohio can help. Arts unlock all kinds of possibilities, right? They make us human, they help us express ourselves, and they can lead to careers too. VSA Ohio Director Aaron Hoppe works to connect artists with disabilities to their passions. So it's a statewide really agency which hosts art shows and supports performance groups geared toward people with autism or comparable disabilities. Creating spaces where, yes, you are welcome here. We want you here. We want you in our doors. There's a community waiting for us to happen to them. And VSA is like an agent. It's like a producer. Art covers a broad spectrum of expression, just like autism itself. And collaboration on stage or on screen can lead to finding a new voice. There's enough of a focus on the ways that art can help reduce, say, anxiety for people on the spectrum, help allow them to pursue passions and develop new passions, and give them the opportunity then to feel confident about as they gradually gain more and more and more skills. And that's really valuable for the autistic people. Up next. Exactly. All right, Carrie. Uh, yes. You, that was a clip of your company pre-pandemic at the height of your creativity and awesomeness. Yes. So you yes. want to talk a little bit about what it was like and then where it is now and what might happen in the future. Yes, when that was filmed, that was a, one of the big moments in how we were meshing with other agencies that serve people with disabilities in Ohio. We were doing an autism conference. We were doing a show in-house where we, obviously it was, I don't know if it was obvious, but it was Willy Wonka. So we were rehearsing that and that show would bring hundreds of people into our theater space, which included a number of different day programs for adults with disabilities who would come and see their peers acting and um, performing for them, as well as the night shows that would bring in general public. So that is pretty much the recipe of what we would do all the time, all year long. We'd be building, writing, rehearsing, and performing plays every three every three to four months with different venues in public as well, like festivals and installations. So all of that stopped, obviously. How many people were you serving there at your peak? A 26, I think, in that space, which is impossible to think of now, how little space that is between each person. Um, so yeah, so it all stopped with COVID and we pretty much relied on Zoom for teaching for most of last year, which is really stifling when you have to pivot that quickly from in-person organic learning where it's like a, a firecracker. One person thinks of something and that sparks 10 other people to think of something. With Zoom, it was just me talking to a captive audience, which really was, that was the most challenging thing I've done in eight years, is make that a interesting process for everybody. And we relied a lot on screen sharing, a lot on experts in their field and videos, um, but everybody stayed with it. And then gradually we're starting to get people back in facility, but we will not be hosting any audiences in our space um, for the foreseeable future. We are booked to do a tomato festival in Reynoldsburg, which is an outside venue. We're gonna have a tomato fashion show and the history of the tomato. <laughs> And that's, I told the people in Reynoldsburg, this is the most exciting thing that's happened to us in a year and a half. <laughs> and so that is something that's giving us back our identity is yes, you know, there's something to do and we can do it unmasked because it'll be outside. So pretty much my troop wants everything back to normal yesterday. And I'm, I thank them pretty much every day that they've stuck through with us through this whole thing. And, and they keep bringing me scripts. One, one of my guys has plotted out our season through 2025. Oh. 
Yeah. So they That's everybody crazy. still has plans and we're big on mashups. So we've got mashups to last us through the year 3000. <laughs> That's wonderful, Carrie. And I will um, share that our company used to travel from Akron to Columbus to see their shows. And it was, you guys have been our inspiration, my inspiration since I first met you many years ago at a VSA event. So hopefully we'll, we'll plow through this and keep on going, Carrie. That, we, we, we vowed to work together and we will. <laughs> right. We are right now. Yeah, we are. <laughs> All right, let's move on to Fran. Fran, I have a clip to share while I'm getting it set up. You wanna talk yeah. a little bit about what we're gonna see? Yes, um, as I said, I am the executive artistic director of Circle Theater. And um, through that work also, uh, all roads lead to, v lead to VSA. I met Wendy um, <laughs> at a VSA conference uh, and we had also vowed to work together. And I took over Circle Theater five years ago and rebranded it as a, an organization for people of all abilities. It had always been a portion of that, but we, we made that the sole mission. And during the pandemic, we were doing a production of Godspell with an inclusive cast and it just didn't work. We had to be rescheduled and we canceled. But during that time, we started doing online residency programming. And then Wendy called and asked if I would direct this production, digital production of More Than Meets the Eye, it's part of the One Act Online Play Festival. And so what you're gonna to see today is a portion of that rehearsal that just took place. And this is our third rehearsal. And I must say, these actors jumped right in with both feet. One of them is understudying or playing a role that you're gonna see in rehearsal because one of the other actors wasn't able to be at rehearsal um, that to yesterday so because he was getting his covid shot right? yes yeah your covid man. shot so he is a <laughs> yeah i'm glad that you're getting your covid shot but and it's working because he was under the weather and so mm. we we allowed him to be under the weather sent him good vibes but <laughs> the rehearsal went on and so what you're going to see this is i think i was discussing with wendy before this is the first and second scene of the play and it takes place a young woman in a wheelchair who is uh, getting her first her film that she spent seven years writing into a festival. And it's actually written by uh, Camilla's, Camilla's uh, group that you'll hear about later. So they wrote the play that I'm directing. Hello, Professor Robinson. How are you today? Was I selected? Thank you for letting me know. I'm so excited for this opportunity. I will get all the uh, travel accommodations. Thank you again. Oh, Rachel, come here. We're going to London. Ah, uh, what? Why are you so excited? The movie has been selected. I hope you have your passport ready to go. It is. I'm, I'm so excited. I've loved this part as long as you've been writing it. It's really special we get to do this together. Well, we should start packing. <laughs> I'm on my way, but the bus was stuck in traffic. I'm off now. I will be there in five minutes. Passing Piccadilly Circle now. Ow! Ow! Yo, Beautiful. watch where you're going! You're the one looking at your phone! Well, Ow. who uses maps these days, idiot? <laughs> uh, do you like my makeup? Huh? Your makeup looks really gross. Very appropriate for the movie. <laughs> do you think I look hot? No, you're covered in blood. <laughs> Are you ready for the next scene? It's pretty deep. I'm ready, but it will be hard. I know I'm just fighting a monster. It's not real, but the scene it reminds me of my past. Well, I wanted it to hit home. 
Uh, well, it certainly did. How did you come up with this part of the movie? The reason I wrote this part was because I wanted to show the biggest obstacle in my life in an artistic way. Um, if we are being very honest, I have struggles with accepting my wheelchair. At times, I've hated it. I've had to constantly battle to accept myself and ignore the stereotype, just be me. Wow, you have overcome so much. I, I really admire that. You have become such a strong person. Yeah, I know I come off as cocky sometimes, but it's just because I've had a rough childhood and I use it as a defense mechanism. Growing up, my family really struggled financially. I had to raise myself and my siblings. I couldn't show any sign of weakness. Well, I have to get to set, but this has been a great talk. I hope we can, we can continue this. Oh, yes. All right. Camilla, what do you think of the scene so far of your play? It was so, it was really emotional seeing it come to life, truly. And just thinking of all the playwrights who worked on it, they're going to be over the moon. It was just, it was beautiful, truly. I, I'm so, I, I'm emotional. Because it was really exciting to see. <laughs> I'm so glad that you, you, uh, you had that reaction because I, yesterday was the first time we had all so many of the actors in one in one zoom room and i was i was had had goosebumps with what i was seeing and knowing that it wasn't i mean well the actor you saw there was playing two different characters i want to let the, justin. Like, our, our, justin it's got quite a range so mm -hmm. uh and uh that that was just great for him to just jump in but this is i said i said to wendy this is uncharted territory this is like you know i've done about directed about 40 plays and acted in about 500 of them. This is the <laughs> only like the second like Zoom play. So it's trying to really like work it out. And I would say this play is great. It is not written specifically for Zoom. I mean, it is written as if we were doing it in a proscenium or a black box, which is great. It should be. And I just wanted to adapt it and make it uh, true for the, the, the form without changing it. And then that last scene that everybody saw, uh, I'm, an, I'm an artist with a disability. So I have cerebral palsy, I walk with crutches. And I really tried to dig in with the performers about their personal experience, sort of using the Stanislavski method. Who am I, where am I, and what is your character mm -hmm. saying? Um, and I wanted to do that delicately because I also said to them, I don't wanna, I don't wanna make, I want this to help us. I don't want to, this to, drudge up things but we've been having some great discussions and that doesn't happen a lot I think in the I have found in the general uh general world of theater it, or if it does it hasn't reached me in the general world or we're maybe just beginning it mm -hmm. but it's nice to have those really what I call vulnerable discussions that mm -hmm. really help inform the work totally great I can feel that coming through for sure with all the actors when we had auditions, no one in a wheelchair showed up. No. So I don't know how you managed to get that woman, but she is fantastic. Yeah, it came from another director in the cohort. Wow. Uh, and there were two people that we reached out to. One responded, and it's been great. And it's like I've known them. I have to, I have to tell the audience, some of, like, two of these people know each other in the non-Zoom world. I've never met any of these people. <laughs> in the zoom world but it feels like you do it feels like we created this ensemble and that's a takeaway from me yeah uh that this the, the theater can happen i always knew the theater could happen anywhere it didn't have to happen on a stage it could happen on a street corner but i never thought about online in that way and she, yeah she's great all right well let us move on to camilla do you have some uh footage to share with us explain what it is and then yes i do um i'm going to show two separate short clips from different times um from our work so as i said i, I work at a rehabilitation program that supports people with developmental and intellectual disabilities and the first clip is some of our work pre-pandemic where we had the opportunity to perform an off-broadway stage um, as a director, I always thought it was so important to just bring visibility to the disability community. 
to get people on stages where a large audience can see their incredible talent as well. So we worked towards that, um, which was amazing. And the second clip will show just a section of some of our um, first online performance, which was, we named it sort of a dramatic reading because we were still exploring the Zoom feature as an online world. Um, which we worked, we had an all-inclusive cast with people with disabilities and without disabilities as well. The artists at Gibney are in the spotlight for making their performance art spaces accessible to everyone. They just hosted an adapted version of the classic Alice in Wonderland in their downtown space with some very special actors. This is tonight's Changemakers. Changemakers, brought to you by Adapt Community Network, empowering people through innovative solutions one person at a time. We change. These actors are preparing to go down the rabbit hole, rehearsing for a special performance of Alice in Wonderland. Many of the actors here are part of the Adapt Community Network, a nonprofit that provides cutting edge programs and services for people with disabilities. It takes practice, practice, practice. Queen Branch is with Adapt, and she plays. Practice! I will know. The Red Queen. Branch says she's calm and happy when on stage and in costume. I feel that it, it, it spreads anything if you put your mind to it. Don't you talk? It works for anybody. Kathleen Archibald is also supported by Adapt Community Network and no stranger to the stage. I was in the Tempest last year. I was the villain. But this is the first time Kathleen and Adapt will be performing publicly in two sold out shows. I was like, oh, wow. Oh, well, people's going to like us. The play is being hosted by Gibney, where the group has been rehearsing for months. The Gibney staff understands the importance of being an inclusive and accessible space. Disability artistry is highlighted within our training, within our presenting, within our discourse, and within our community as a whole. Cara Gilmore, the senior director of community action at Gibney, says while their space was always wheelchair accessible, artists with disabilities had to use a service elevator. And that is not emblematic of who we are as an institution and the message that we want to send to the artists that we serve. So Gibney made installing this new elevator a priority project. It's fitted for wheelchairs and located at the main entrance. When we come in to sign in, we are coming in with just everyone else. And so they were able to like meet and greet people in the same way that any other actor or dancer would come in. It's a structural change with profound meaning, sending a message to people with disabilities who use the Gibney. A place like the Gibney gives people a chance to perform and show their craft to the world. All right, well, we hear both sold out shows went well. The group is looking forward to their next project. If you'd like more information on the Adapt Community Network and the services they provide, you can visit their website at adapt, adaptcommunitynetwork.org. And if you know a change maker, reach out to me on Facebook at Tamsin Fidel. Love to hear from you. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's Sorry. very cool. May Narcissus love one day so himself and not win over the creature that he loves. Nemesis heard him, goddess of vengeance, and judged the plea as righteous. One day, as he passed the fountain Olympus, he gazed into the crystal water and saw an image in the pool and fell in love with that unbodied hope and found the substance in what was only shadow. Oh, 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 really? Oh, my God. He loves himself. <laughs> The love becomes the lover. <laughs> How often he tries to kiss the image in the water. <laughs> Vain and elusive, he almost drowns in his own watching eyes. Oh, my God. I would tell you. Yet the image cannot escape the pool. Oh, there we are. I oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he burned with love. His sorrow took all his strength away. He so we did an adaptation. We had, we took Metamorphosis, the epic Greek play, and we adapted it. We chose six um, of the myths, and we adapted it. Um, so we had all of them together stringed in. And that was the scene of Echo and Narcissus. Um, little taste of that. You have been 
uh, my conscience in terms of being inclusive online. Because when I started experimenting with Zoom, I wasn't even thinking about our friends who can't see, our friends who can't hear, our friends who can only understand through sign language. And you jumped right in there and showed us how to do it. So we are committed to making our plays accessible that way from now on. I think we're all looking ahead to after the pandemic, but online theater is gonna stick around mm -hmm. because now we can serve people all around the world. We have had students sign up for our programming in counties in upstate Wisconsin where they have no theater programs and moms are saying, oh, if we only had one of you guys in our community, but at least we can sign up and be online. So thank you for that. Uh, would you like to talk a little bit about uh, where you are now with your programming and what you see in your future? Yes, of course, thank you. Um, yeah, definitely, like you said, when we for sure always want to make sure everything we put out online and when we had performances in person as well, we always had um, a night where there would be a sound interpretation and we would try to make it as accessible as possible. I think we'll talk a little bit later about sometimes how the challenges of finding um, accessible spaces and also funding for these access needs are also a big challenge. Um, but yeah, definitely right now, all, all our programming are online. So all of our theater classes um, are online. Um, we have a playwriting group, which is what, how we wrote the More Than Meets the Eye, which is play Fran is directing. Um, but yeah, everything's been online right now. Our, our day program programs are slowly opening, but it's going to be very, very limited capacity. So it'll definitely be a while until we're able to create a sort of in-person performance that is as vast as we have before. And definitely, I think similar to um, what a lot of people are doing is that we might potentially be able to, once we're able to have a few people in a space, have performances, but live stream it on Zoom, not having in-person audiences, like you said, as well. Um, but that's what we're looking at now. Also, all of our actors have been wanting to go back to normal and just get back together. But I think the benefit of being online is that we've been able to connect with people, like, for example, through CADA from around the United States with actors that are not just from our company. So it's been amazing to just work with people that we wouldn't necessarily be able to work with before. So that's definitely a benefit of the online world of theater. Now, we don't have any rehearsal footage from your play, but would you like to talk a little bit about what you're directing and how it's going? Yes, of course. Um, I'm directing the Bookstore of Doom, which was written by um, a student who attends program at CAIDA, Samir. And actually, Justin, who is in Friends Play, is also an actor in our show. Um, rehearsal have been going amazing. We've been rehearsing for a month and a half now. And at the end of this month, we're going to be recording the whole performance. Um, and I've been working towards recording it as early as possible to work on access needs as well for the performance. But yeah, it's been great. It's been like Fran said as well. I feel like I've known all these actors, but I've never met any of them in person. But being together and creating a comfortable space where you're just being creative together, I feel like brings people closer to each other. So it's been it's been amazing for sure. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to share a little bit of rehearsal from the play I'm directing. And it is a play about autism written by a young man with autism from India. And the theme of the play is learning how to communicate when you don't speak. An Indian wise man or a sadhu meets a young boy who can't speak. And he tries to figure out how to connect. They meet again on another day. And this time the sadhu furthers the communication by using visuals. And that is often a way people with autism learn how to communicate. They don't have a fancy eye tablet to uh, communicate with. They use just a sketchbook. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
it's I, when I first read the script, I knew this was the one I had to direct because I love pantomime. I love uh, the theme of it, the communication challenges, the fact that he chose the tortoise and the hare as the story to act out, I thought was brilliant because the lesson is you don't all have to go at the same rate in order to be a winner. You can be slow and steady and win the race, or you can start from far behind and still win the race. So um, we have heard from everyone about their play, except for Carrie. Carrie, you want to share a yes. little bit about your play that you're directing? Well, mine is called Crossing the River, and it is about animal helpers and about trust, and it's a gorgeous fable. And basically, it's a combination of narration, shadow puppets, and live filming. Ooh. And so yesterday, I it's interesting the cast because everybody has a connection to ShopWorks, but like six degrees away mm. from it. So it's kind of that ripple effect of you create this wonderful arts organism and other stuff builds from it. So I've got um, a friend of mine, his just connection after connection after connection. But at the end of the day, they have these two gorgeous children and the mom is Caucasian and the dad is Indian. So, and the, and the, the little boy has hearing aids. So I'm like, oh my God, trifecta right here to be crude about it. I'm like, ah, I got to have this kid. So we went over to their house yesterday and it was a beautiful day to film. And he was so much fun to direct. And he was so excited to do this. And his little sister was supposed to be in it too, but she just stared at us from a proper distance. But at the end of the shoot, the little boy, Oliver, he had the line still in his mouth. And so he started playing with his little sister to get him to get her to say the lines. So we got some of that on film too. Aww. So it was and the the shadow puppets, um they're just gonna be a gorgeous part because the, basically in order to make this beautiful fable come alive, I've got the live action, I've got the shadow puppets at the beginning and that turns into a live action segment. And in order for them to cross the river, they have help from an elephant and they turn back into the shadow puppet land to get across the river. And in this whole scene, there's a macaque monkey that's either trying to mess with them, they think he's trying to steal their laptop, but what he's really trying to do is get them to stop because the river is rising. Oh. So there's all these gorgeous elements that are very visual. And another person that I got that's a six degree separation is a man who works for us. He started out as a driver and now he works in the day program and he's from Africa. So I was able to get him to narrate and he's never done anything like that. So I put him in our light booth and I lined it with all this foam. And so he did the narrative and he was so nervous and so excited. And that's exactly what this has always been about for me was to introduce the arts to people that had no idea that's what they were gonna do that day. And then they, they, they come away just grinning. And so it, it's, it's in the editing stage. It's in the, we still have to shoot the shadow puppets, but I've already, I made them all and they look beautiful. So that's what mine is. Carrie has a very strong visual artistry, which is why I thought this play would be perfect for her. And I'm I so thank glad you. you chose it. Yeah. Oh, cool. Can't I, wait. I wanted to ask this question, though, of everyone. In your programs, is disability, autism represented on your staff and in technical positions, as well as in the acting? 
And along with that, what are the challenges for increasing inclusivity in all areas of theater? Well, I can speak to, in my program, that is the goal that everybody that is part of the company learns all of the positions. The uh, challenges are adapting things either from the OT side of things where it actually works with whatever limited mobility they present with, like say the light board or um, the sound or the staging itself. You know, the sets need to be a certain, they need to be free of certain obstacles for some actors. Mm -hmm. um, and the audiences as well. We always make sure that we have a huge dedicated space for anybody that uses a wheelchair, um, anybody that needs to sit on the floor to watch a show. And we also are extremely accommodating for different ways of being an audience member because some people have to leave the show and we are trained to react as if nothing's happening so that the caregiver and the person that needs to leave aren't shamed, but maybe the next time they see a show, they can sit through the whole thing. So we're able to do that because we are designed for that purpose. I don't, I can't speak to if that translates to like a Broadway situation or a community theater situation because there's many more factors at play. But for our company, that piece is as important as making the work. I so agree with you. Fran, um, could you answer the same question and maybe give us a little broader picture of your company and what you guys do? Sure. Uh, well, yes, Circle Theater uh, produces pre-pandemic four shows a year. And during the pandemic, we we got one show in and then had to postpone the rest. But really what we, there are other day programs in the city that do arts programming. And there's a couple that do theater. We are, we these, all, these day programs are great because they don't like to keep, they're not selfish. Their goal of the day program is to have other programs for their individuals to participate in besides their uh, day program. So we we go through all of those. We, we are an alternative to those places. When they're not working there, they come to us. And we rehearse all in the evenings, usually an eight week to 10 week process, two to three days a week, inclusive, meaning those with and without disabilities. And we don't, of course, ask what your disability is. So I, I we get a lot of individuals, I would say, who are on the spectrum, who were never diagnosed, or who just never had that opportunity to, but we have, we're have we barrier free, borrowing something from our, my colleague, Sally Bailey, that we, I really use a lot of universal design for learning so that we meet people where they are and we bring them in. And if I have someone, I have an artist who is on the spectrum, uh, has very high functioning, but just needs extra processing time. So we just make sure that they have their script ahead of time and, and we work and we answer questions and we just keep rehearsing. And we try not, disability is the thing, but it's not the thing. We, um, I don't like to use the word normalize. There's no such thing as normal. We just create an open, an open space. And so that's really what, what we are about. And to answer the question, before the pandemic, we had an internship program specifically to teach individuals with disabilities backstage skills. Wow. These individuals came to us being on stage and they were interested in backstage portion of things. And so we had three to four and we're beginning, we began that process. The pandemic changed that. However, we are currently looking for funding. And even if we don't get it, we'll bring back that program. And so it's really, this is a roundabout way of saying, that all abilities are welcome and we meet you where you are. Fantastic, Fran. Camilla, do you have any um, insights into being more inclusive backstage as well as on stage and audience inclusiveness? Yeah, for sure. Um, 
in terms of how in my programming how we've been always been doing things is that we always think it's important to just have people with disabilities on stage and backstage off stage as well so with playwriting designing um, creating music and everything and all the technical aspects as well and we accommodate and adapt whatever is possible to do that so for example um we have art specialists and music specialists that work also with the people at day programs so when we want to create original music for the play we work with um people to think to bring in their ideas and what they feel would work for a play and create that together we do have some adaptive equipment um for music um engineering and stuff and the music specialist works with that so they create together music um we also have some adaptive equipment for like art making so some of the pieces you saw in Alice in Wonderland um, in the video, we work together with the artists with people with disabilities so they could also create and paint our set design and our props and everything. So we do try to have as much um, equipment necessarily for accommodation and also on stage as well. Some we've worked with actors that were so interested um, in participating in performances, but that uh, that use communication devices. And we would, of course, adapt our scripts and whatever needed to create that inclusivity as well. So, um, for example, we cast an actor in a role that communicated with his device and we were able to program with the speech therapist before his lines into the device. And he was able to memorize and work with all the actors, the correct moment to, of course, um, say his line was his device. So it was amazing that we were able to create that inclusion um, with everyone's mode of communication which I think is the beauty of theater as well, because we're all expressing ourselves in so many different ways. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Uh, I think one of the things I'm proudest of is that some of the young people that I began working with a long time ago uh, have grown up to become teachers for our organization. Mm. They have kept their love of theater and have worked hard and are the best teachers that we have because they know how to connect, they understand the challenges, and they can teach those of us who are not on the spectrum how to be better teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, in our county here in Akron, Ohio, in our city, we have had a recent initiative to make all of the arts more inclusive. And our company was on the committee to write up what that was going to be about. It's, it's shocking to me how it's shocking and yet not shocking how many companies just don't even think about it. They will rent an old space and it's a wonderful, funky old space and everybody says, oh, this is cool, but someone with a wheelchair can't get up the steps, mm. right? There's a lot of that going on. So we're, we are trying to raise the consciousness of our community about being inclusive for not only audiences, but for performers. And we are proud to be a part of that initiative. One of the ideas that came out of our meetings was to establish a lending library of accessible equipment that theater companies could borrow, like a mm -hmm. captioning device, like a portable ramps, things mm -hmm. like that, so that theater companies who haven't put in that outreach can do that. And I would encourage anyone watching this with a community who feels that there could be more accessibility to take this as an idea and push it in your community. What are some of the challenges that you have found about developing more inclusivity in audiences? I was at a, an online conference and a comment was made that, well, all of these local theater companies will have an autism day where it's sensory friendly, but we're still segregating them to a specific night. So do you have any thoughts about that? How can we not segregate yet be more inclusive for our audiences? Let's start with Carrie. That's a tough one. And my experience is, so what I've created is a very sensitive world to everybody's way of being in an audience. And you buy into that when you come to see one of our shows. Um, I have been, and a lot of my actors go see theaters, neurotypical people theater productions without any events. And 
but there are some of my guys that would go see something and sing along with every word in an audience. And I, as an audience member, wouldn't appreciate that. So there's this, it's a very complicated issue coming from all sides. I'm seeing it from all sides. And I'm seeing it in terms of the money that is put out to see a show, what the audience expects to see a show. I'm seeing the complications from what I've seen of getting my people to a show because a lot of the people that I work with aren't in charge of their own transportation, their own schedule, their own choices. So there's that piece of um, disability if you're not in charge of your own life, getting the people to what they really want to do. Um, so from my perspective, I can I can see a lot of challenges, a lot of there's not an one easy answer. Fantastic. I agree with you. Um, and especially in terms of I love I love being in the audience at your at your theater space. And I think we need to educate the general population who might just be a little bit too privileged about going to the theater, you know? Yeah. It must be a church and everything is holy and silent. It doesn't have to be that way all the time. Right. Sometimes the responses that come from the audience make the experience even better. And I, I think that the the proximity to the actors is a big part of why it gets to be such an organic experience for everybody. Like, I'm not sure if that whole feeling would translate to a bigger stage and a more distanced audience. Mm, I think you're right. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on this, Fran? Uh, yes. Um, I, in terms of an audit, when I started at Circle Theater, when I rebranded it, we had a lot of discussion with the board. Uh, I brought in a lot of new board members, but then those longstanding board members were saying, oh, how do you get an audience for this? The general audience doesn't want to come and watch an individual with a disability. And I said, oh, you're wrong. They do. And they just don't, they don't think about it that way. So it's like, they don't think about disability. They don't see it that way. They want to see a play. So there are those that, if we do a play that they'll have their crowd come. You know, you've, you've all seen those actors that their group comes to see the show and actors with disabilities are no different. We just need to, my policy has always been, we just need to create good theater with individuals with disabilities in the mix woven into the fabric of our play and they will come. And over time in my five years, it's been, we're a very small company um, and in Omaha, there are seven or eight um, very large companies. And we were, I was rebranding. So I knew rebranding was going to be difficult. But we had slowly sort of had a, a small but loyal following. And they know when they come to see us that we're going to, you're going to get an inclusive experience, but they're not going to get hit over the head with disability. That doesn't mean that someday there are lots of plays about specific disabilities that I will want to do and they're on the list. But it's going to be about creating and weaving these fine artists who happen to have disabilities into the work that they do and show that. And then if they get to be in another theater that isn't necessarily disability specific, that's great. And if we can show that we can be inclusive in that way and that other theaters can adopt it, that's great too. Outstanding. Yes. Camilla. Yeah, I'm so happy you said that, Fran. I 100% agree that it's about creating, like putting on these performances, putting on stories and plays that doesn't have to be necessarily centered around disability. It's like there are actors with disabilities that could be playing a role of a character that doesn't necessarily have a disability, but weaving that all in together to make audience see that is inclusion, right? It's not, it's, it's about including and not integrating, which I think is different, like how you were saying, Wendy, creating like a separate night for people with autism to go, but that's just, that's not including them in the performance in the process. That's just like integrating them into an experience, which is not the same as inclusion. Um, yeah, and I think it's, I always think that is is not just who is at the table, but it's, it's how the table is set, right? Is how people can arrive at the table and be able to access it. So 
some theater spaces, they might have accessible wheelchair seating, but they're often mostly at the back. So why do people in wheelchairs and disabilities have to be the people that have probably the worst view of the stage and experience? Exactly. Like that's that's not inclusion. So it's about creating these spaces that are accessible, but equal access for everyone to have, choose what, like to have the same experience. It's common in like even like games and stadiums and everything, you know, just the general structure um, of when a lot of people come together. And yeah, I think that's definitely a challenge and that's something that theater spaces have to think about a lot um, just to make it as inclusive as possible. And of course, also thinking of not just having like one night that has an option that has ASL interpretation and closed captions and audio description, but many different options because availabilities, you know, it should probably, if there was enough funding, it would be best for every night to have all the access, right. needed, of course, but that is a challenge as well um, of having that resource. Over the pandemic, I've watched a lot of theater from around the world, thanks to streaming and also a lot of British television because I seem to like it a lot. And I <laughs> have noticed many actors, professional actors with disabilities in productions. And they ranged from not having an arm or a leg to um, various other types of physical and uh, developmental disabilities. And they were just playing a part. Mm -hmm. And I look at American television and I don't see this. Mm -hmm. What do we have to do in this country to get representation in, at the professional level? I think it's starting. I think um, Ali Stroker being in yeah. Oklahoma. Yeah. I think, um, and I was just before this um, meeting, I just looked up why the people behind that remount of Oklahoma, what were, were they looking to be inclusive? Is that why they looked for that actress? I mean, she's a, she's a firecracker. I saw it. Actor. I sat in the front row. Oh, you did? Oh, wow. yes. oh my God. Yeah. So, and she was talking about yep. how the the venue still had to make some structural oh, yeah. changes to accommodate her. And yeah. then that made me think of the that time is money and there's no money and yeah. nobody wants to to put well, anything else out, but look how it paid off. It's yeah. interesting you say that because when I went to see Allie in the show and I had met her previously when I'm on the board of the American Alliance for Theater and Education, she's a friend of a friend. And I went, they had to take me out of the main lobby and around into an office building, into circle in the square and down an elevator to my, to my seat. Mm. Um, and, and so, but, but I had a long, that's a, that's a blessing also, because I had a long talk with house management about <laughs> how they were doing all of this and asking about, you know, how she was integrated into the show and what they've, and what they've done. And it, it's fascinating because it, it had opened some things at Circle in the Square, according to this house management. Circle in the Square, as I understand it, Camilla, you live in New York. I mean, it's a school. Um, and I had seen three Broadway shows there. Mm -hmm. always taking that same route through the building and down but they are they, it really was a beginning to think about it and she Allie had been with the show since it had been at St. Anne's Warehouse mm -hmm. and Daniel Fish the creator of that production really I, I mean he really just saw Allie and they really just used her chair and she it was it was dynamic electric it's like I will never see Oklahoma the same way again we could go on this all day and let's see <laughs> So she was, she was, did she audition with everyone else to be that part? Just My understanding like a, was, yeah, like she did. Yep. Yep. When she had done Spring Awakening, which is, uh, was with sign language, the Deaf West had done. So they had seen her. There was a, there was a template, but my understanding is Daniel Fish. And if anybody's watching this and, and has something else to say about it, reach out to me, tell me the, the real story, <laughs> but this is my, this is my understanding. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's also, I love that you brought that up about Ali Stroker because it's so important. And I think it was a big moment in the disability community. Yeah. 
But I think it's also important for us to remember that I mean, another amazing achievement is that Ellie Stroker won the Tony for yes. this. Mm -hmm. But at the Tony Awards, there was no ramp for the stage. No. <laughs> so no. they didn't create an accessible space, even considering that a person with a disability could win an award. Right. So, right, right. Just like mind boggling. Yeah. The structure. Um, the ableism is so ingrained so deeply. Yeah. Um, so true. Uh, in this country, there's also been a tendency not to cast people with autism in roles that are written for an autistic character. Yes. Uh, I watched a program from Israel called uh, On the Spectrum. Has anyone seen that? I have. Yes, I was mm -hmm. just blown away by it. It's going. It's been picked up and it's going to be redeveloped for the United States. The actors had autism. They were all living the plot was they were living in a house and they were all together and they were dealing with their lives and trying to live their lives. It was very real to me. What did mm. you think, Fran? Oh, it was very real and, and, and dynamic. And it made me think, it made me proud and sad at the same time, because at the same time I was coaching a young actor with a disability um, that had an, that was for an audition and uh, for a series on one of these streaming platforms that children remain nameless but the streaming series the service knows who they are. <laughs> and this person wasn't, was told, oh, you're great, but you're not disabled enough. Uh, you're not enough disabled. And so shame on you, streaming service. What does that mean? I don't know what that means. I still don't know. It takes me back to when I was an actor in a community theater production and I had done the music man like five times and been nominated for an award for this role at the beginning with the train. And there was a director that, uh, a music director was very interested. And the director was like, oh, we can't cast you because we can't get the train off without them seeing your crutches because there were no crutches in 1903. <laughs> uh, and I, I just, what, I don't know what that means. So, so I, I, I still crutches? don't know. 1903, I don't know. So, and I don't <laughs> I mean to go off on it. Trees lost their limbs of wood, right? That's right. Yeah. That's right. I was like, go back to school. I don't know what your degree is in, but sure ain't not dramaturgy. History. Not history yeah. and not dramaturgy. So I, I, but that, that for me, that says there's more education that has to be done. And it's, I, and it sounds like a broad statement. It's lack of imagination. Yeah. We have been so ingrained that this is what Marion Peru looks like. This is what this looks like. And we're afraid to take whatever chance this is. I, I'm sorry, there's not enough money in the world th to say that we can't take the chance in this. There is no chance. It's like, this is, this is the now. And so I, and I think I've sort of learned that it also is lack of representation at the leadership level. Um, Absolutely. You know, yeah. We don't have casting directors with this. We, we have very few of them. We have very few artistic directors with disabilities. Um, in the in in the general theater world, and so that will change when we as we get more people upstairs. And the producers. Yes. Yeah. Before concluding our panel discussion on inclusive theater, we'd like to share with you the complete one act play festival schedule, featuring the work of the four directors on this panel and four other directors from around the country. All of these plays will be pre-recorded online. You buy a ticket and you get access to see it. And then there will be a live talk back with each group on the Sunday evening. And that's free when you buy a ticket. Once all the plays have been recorded and seen for the first time, we are going to post them on our YouTube channel and they will be there for all perpetuity so that we inspire more people to do what we're doing, which is creating inclusive theater. I want to thank you all for joining us today and for adding your insight into this very important topic. Thank you very much.